Good morning, friends. Those of you here in the room and those of you watching online, um, I'm just so thankful to be here today and to get to share with you. We're looking at Anna and Simeon today and how they watched with faithful expectation and how we can be ready like they were. A few weeks ago, a Christian author friend of mine posted on Facebook uh, about an encounter she and her husband had had in an airport when they were traveling. They were on their way to the gate when Cheryl, being a much braver person than I, spotted a Jewish man leaning over a large book. She grabbed her husband's arm, pulled him over, and she plopped down beside this man and said a cheery hello and noted that he was reading a Jewish commentary. Since he seemed willing to chat, I'm not sure if he had a choice, honestly, um, he, uh, they engaged him in conversation about general world affairs. I'm quoting Cheryl's post now. He said, the world is a dark place. People must seek truth. These wars will all end when Messiah finally comes. When we asked him his feelings about Jesus, he said, oh, he's a very bad man. He practiced all sorts of magic and such. Did you get this from the history books? Cheryl asked him. Yes, these are all known facts. In her post, Cheryl went on to say, his desperation for Messiah to be born just broke my heart. Some way, somehow, God kept giving Dwight and me, her husband, the right words I got to share about Jesus being born in Bethlehem, as prophesied. How he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. How we are actually the temple of the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. God resides in us. Oh, Jesus, it's still such a wonder to even ponder it, writes Cheryl. God loves you so much, Cheryl told him, and he's going to keep bringing Christ followers your way to share with you, just like we're doing. Probably wasn't looking forward to that, was he? This story was fresh on my mind when Pastor Tom asked me to speak on Simeon and Anna, who watched with faithful expectation, just like this Jewish rabbi was doing. So I was ready to say yes, although I must admit, I wondered for a few minutes if he asked me because of the color of my hair, thinking I could identify with those old folks. Uh, but I think there are several ways that we can all identify, regardless of our age or hair color. So uh, we're going to look at those today. First, though, let's pray together. Dear Father God, thank you for the opportunity to gather together this Sunday to consider how to ready our hearts for celebrating Jesus' birth with joy. We get so wound up in the day-to-day -day stuff, the decorations and gifts and shortbread cookies that we, that we sometimes fail to pause and reflect on the amazingness of your gift of salvation. Please help us ready our hearts like Simeon and Anna who steadfastly waited for the Messiah they knew was coming. And Lord, I'd also like to pray for Cheryl's new friend, Dov, today, and ask that he might consider that Jesus is the Messiah he's been waiting for, but hasn't recognized. Thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So let's have a look at what we know about this aged pair from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Then it was time for their purification offering, that's Mary and Joseph, as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, which is either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly awaiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him, 
and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Anna, a prophet who was also there in the temple, was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There, the child grew up healthy and strong, He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. Two specific things take place in this single event when Jesus is 40 days old. Those rituals are Mary's purification after the birth of a child, and then the presentation of the firstborn son, as commanded in um, Exodus 13. Joseph and Mary visited the temple on that particular day, carrying Jesus uh, for the specific purpose of this pair of rituals. On this particular day, they were met by an old man, and a few minutes later, by an old woman. These two faithful ones had messages for Mary and Joseph about the baby in their arms. What can we learn from Simeon and Anna about preparing our hearts for the coming Messiah? First, they were watchful. They didn't just give lip service to being watchful and aware. They lived it. The Holy Spirit had revealed to Simeon that he would not die before seeing the Lord's Messiah. We don't know when he received this revelation. We don't know how many weeks or months or possibly years he had been waiting. He came to the temple, hopeful today would be the day, but we do know that he is now an old man and he is ready to die when this revelation is revealed to him. As I thought about the timing, I wondered, was Simeon in the temple that day Zechariah was chosen by Lot to burn incense in the holy place? Was he in the crowd when Zechariah exited the temple, unable to speak? Luke says the crowd realized that Zechariah had seen a vision. Did Simeon file that away for future reference? Later, news filtered around town that old Zechariah had gotten old Elizabeth in the family way. Did Simeon wonder at all for even a brief second if this might be the Messiah? No, no, he he knew better than that. The Messiah would come from the line of David, from Jacob's son Judah, and Zechariah was a Levite, so no, not that. Simeon knew. He'd studied all that. But a vigilant historian like Simeon would also have heard what happened over in the hill country of Judea a few months later. He would have heard that Zechariah named that newborn John. He would also have heard about Zechariah's song recorded in Luke chapter 1. Simeon would have heard these words um, that Pastor Tom shared with us a couple of weeks ago in his message. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. 
because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. So Simeon would have said to himself, okay, well, this baby is not the Messiah, but he is the one sent to prepare the way. Hmm. And then Simeon kept watching. He visited the temple often, observing as child after child was presented to the Lord. Was this the one? What was this baby's lineage? How about this one over here? Anna was equally as watchful. She'd been married seven years before her husband died, and now she's 84. She moved right into the temple so she could watch and fast and pray right there at the center of things. No one was going to tell Anna after the fact about the Messiah's presentation. She was going to be right there witnessing it firsthand. How watchful are we? Do we, you know, glance around a little bit sometimes here and there? Or do we have an observant posture all the time? All the time? So firstly, Simeon and Anna were watchful. Secondly, they were in the right place. Simeon and Anna both gravitated to the temple. They knew that someday the Messiah would come and be presented as the firstborn son, as a firstborn son. It seemed logical that this was the place where they would get to meet him. They didn't just talk about meeting the Messiah. They purposefully frequented a place where they'd be sure to see him. Thirdly, they were faithful. Both Simeon and Anna were being faithful. Not only were they in the right place, but they were doing the right thing with the right attitude. Simeon is called righteous and devout. The Holy Spirit led him to the temple that particular day. Our sister, uh, Leslie LeBlanc, pointed me to the book 40 Days with the Holy Spirit by Jack Levison several, year, several months ago. I was going to say years. Nope, not years. Um, I've been reading snippets of this periodically. I've got it on my phone. I just borrowed Leslie's for, to show you here. Um, but I haven't been reading it like every day, um, even though I, I guess you're supposed to, right? 40 days with the Holy Spirit. Our small group met a few weeks ago to talk about the fifth covenant affirmation, as many of your small groups did as well. And what's the fifth covenant affirmation? A conscious dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Later in the study, I mentioned that I'd be sharing today about Simeon and Anna. And Leslie said, oh, this book contains an entire devotional on Simeon. You might want to look that up. And so, of course, I did. The beautiful reminder in this reading is that every phrase, every word of Simeon's prayer song is from Isaiah chapters 40 to 55, like the worship team read for us earlier. The point, Simeon knew his scriptures. I quote from Levison's book, the whole of Simeon's being is saturated by those prophetic visions. Simeon is inspired, in other words, because he is vigilant, because he is regular in devotion, and because he has studied the poignant prophecies of Isaiah, which he now sees taking shape in this very young Galilean boy who will be a light to the nations. Levison goes on to say, a clear model for receiving the Spirit's guidance rises from regular devotion to learning. Sometimes a single significant moment comes along when, we have, when all we have studied comes together and we recognize the salvation of God. It can be as surprising as a Nazarene baby carried to the temple, two turtle doves in tow, by his peasant parents. What about Anna? She spent her days and nights worshiping God by fasting and praying in the temple. She was also staunchly immersed in her faith. Together, they are great examples of ministering by simply living for God. They showed others how to walk with the Lord, teaching by example. They didn't have a separate Sabbath persona. They didn't live one way for six days and then pretend to be pious on the seventh. They lived their faith every single day and encouraged others to do the same. Part of the reason Simeon and Anna recognized Jesus is that they were watching for him. 
they were faithful to God, not content to simply fulfill the basic religious requirements, the bare minimums of faith. In fact, Simeon was so absolutely certain this baby was the Messiah that he just walked up to them and declared it. And fourthly, they spread the news. Anna came along as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph. She began praising God and talking about the child to everyone, or at least everyone who is waiting expectantly for God's salvation. Can you just picture her? I can see um, Mary and Joseph coming in with the baby, and I, I see Simeon intercepting them. And he takes the baby in his arms, and they're this little huddle, and he's praying, and Mary's looking at him like, what are you talking about? All this stuff about a sword piercing my, my heart. And, and then there's Anna, and she sees what's going on over there. I can kind of see her circling around it. She's making sure everyone notices. She's touching an arm here and a shoulder over there. Look, do you see what's happening? You know Simeon, right? How Yahweh told him that he wouldn't die until he saw the Lord's Messiah? That's what's happening right now. Anna's excitement is palpable. And what's going on while she's doing this, this circling thing? Simeon is praying, or possibly singing, we're not sure exactly which. Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Who's Messiah? Israel's Messiah, right? That's not Simeon's focus. He remembers the promise to Abraham that through his offspring, the whole world will be blessed. There are numerous other prophecies that the Messiah will be a light to the nations and not just a savior to the Jewish people. Simeon is praising God for our salvation. He's looking forward into a future that he will personally not see. To where God's word is preached around the globe, to where the church will be established on every continent, where the good news will be preached to every tribe and tongue and people. Simeon, he won't even see the baby Jesus grow up. He will not see Elizabeth's boy baptize Mary's boy in the Jordan River. He won't see Jesus healing the sick or feeding the hungry or raising the dead. He won't hear the Sermon on the Mount or wonder at Jesus' choice of those 12 disciples. He won't witness Jesus' death and resurrection. There is so much more to come, but Simeon will not see it. And Simeon seems to be okay with that. He praises God for what he has been able to see, and he steps down from his post. The term, let your servant depart in peace, is a military term to describe a soldier being dismissed after his duty is finished. Simeon's mission was accomplished. The promise to him fulfilled. His wait was over. His job was done. And if you can kind of hear bagpipes playing taps in the background, that's what this moment was. Meanwhile, we still have Anna, right? Circling the crowd. Did you see that? Did you hear? Have a look at Mary and Joseph's baby over there. He's the Messiah. If anyone would know, it would be Simeon. Also, listen to Simeon sing. What a voice. Then, of course, the romance author in me goes, I wonder why Simeon and Anna never got together. They obviously have a lot in common. <laughs> Maybe Simeon's married, we don't know. Um, anyway, uh, back to the point. <laughs> What can we learn from Simeon and Anna? They witnessed the first coming of Jesus, and we look back to that event every year at Christmas time, but we also look forward to the second coming of Jesus. We look both directions like a pedestrian about to cross the street. Those folks 2,000 years ago did not understand that the Messiah would come twice. They wanted, oh, well, they expected him to fulfill all the prophets, the, the, uh, all the promises the prophets had been speaking of. They glossed over some of the verses, like those in Isaiah 53, because they didn't really seem to fit with the rest of the story. 
It's most likely why Judas betrayed Jesus. He was trying to give the Messiah a little nudge to get on with the conquering hero bit. That's why you're here after all. Not realizing that these scriptures needed to be fulfilled first. No wonder rabbis like Cheryl's friend Dov are confused about Jesus' identity. Pastor Tom has talked numerous times about how we live in this gap in between time. There's a tension here. We can look backward to promises fulfilled and forward to promises that will be fulfilled. We can see Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection as a separate time while history stretches on for these 2,000 plus years. How are we to live in this gap in between? First, like Simeon and Anna, let's be watchful. This requires knowing what we are watching for. So we must immerse in the scripture and meditate on it. We can't be watchful for something we know little about. If you have no idea what a bear is, and someone says, keep an eye out for bears, how will you know if you've seen one? You need to know what they look like, where they might be found, what they might be doing then you stand a chance of spotting one. Simeon and Anna were able to recognize the Messiah because they had studied the scripture. They knew their laws and prophets. They knew those prophecies inside and out. And with that in mind, they knew what to look for. How much do we study for ourselves? How much do we expect Pastor Tom or our small group leaders or authors of Christian devotional books to do it for us? is no substitute for digging into scripture ourselves. Second, like Simeon and Anna, let's be in the right place. The writer of Hebrews said, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let's not forsake the gathering of ourselves together, and that's not just Sunday morning here in the building. Let's be in our small groups, in our spiritual friendships, in our lunch dates, and our afternoon walks. Let's challenge each other to be watchful. Let's be in the right place with the right posture. Third, like Simeon and Anna, let's be faithful and obedient. Simeon received a promise that guided his life. It focused him on following God faithfully. We're not told why Anna chose to move into the temple as a young widow instead of remarrying, which would have been the normal thing to do. We're only told that's what she did. What does faithful obedience look like here, today, in your life and in mine? I suggest it includes worship. It includes looking out for what Jesus is doing in the world around us. It includes recognizing him when we see him in action. And as you can see, there's no age limit. We can and should be faithful and obedient as long as we live, like Simeon and Anna. What has God called you to do? Keep doing it, faithfully. And finally, like Simeon and Anna, let's spread the news. Simeon's prayer song includes these words, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. How will God's light reveal God to the nations? How will all people know about the salvation that God has prepared for them? We have to be like Simeon and Anna here too. Verse 39 says, Anna talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. How many do you think believed these two old gray-haired people? Did those around them think that maybe old Simeon was finally off his rocker? That Alzheimer's might have come for dear Anna? Remember, there's not much to back up their claims. That rumor from a few months ago about Zechariah and Elizabeth? Okay, sure. <laughs> and those shepherds out in Bethlehem? Who can trust the words of shepherds? There aren't any public miracles yet. No baptism. No dove, no voice from above declaring Jesus as anyone special. He hasn't taught in the synagogue or on the hillsides or from a fishing boat, rocking people's worlds with his profound, thoughtful teaching and increasingly pointed claims about his relationship to the Father. 
Some will have filed away the witness of Simeon and Anna to be examined years later, but at the moment, it was frankly kind of a wild story with no actual proof. Did they let that stop them? No way. They knew this baby was the answer. They knew salvation had come to all people. They knew a light was now shining where only darkness had existed before. They knew people needed to hear the truth. They were primed and ready to share their excitement at the birth of this precious baby. Do we remember this too? That God has entrusted this message to us to carry to those around us? Do we feel the same urgency that this pair did? Christmas is just a couple of weeks ago away. Many people are more receptive to hearing words of a savior at this time of year. Even households that revolve around Santa and parties and gifts pay a little more attention to the idea of a baby born in a manger coming to bring peace on earth. They know some of the carols, like Away in a Manger and Joy to the World and Silent Night. They're more willing to talk and listen in this season than most other times of the year. It's kind of like they expect to hear about Jesus alongside Santa. We can and should show Christ to our friends, neighbors, and families in action year-round, of course. But this time of year, they expect it. Don't let them down. We can invite them to the Christmas Eve service. There's invitations at that back table right there. We can draw up a Christmas card by that has a manger scene instead of a jolly elf. Let's be creative finding ways to bring Jesus to those around us. Does your life tell people about Jesus? Do your actions? How about your words? In Romans 10, Paul said this, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Simeon and Anna had beautiful feet. They recognized the good news in the birth of this baby boy, and then they told everyone around them. How about us? If we are not sharing the good news of Jesus during the Christmas season, when are we doing it? Will we ever? Let's be ready to share. Ready like Simeon and Anna, who watched with faithful expectation, recognized God at work, and told those around them. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you so much for inspiring Luke to include the story of Simeon and Anna in his gospel. Thank you that we are never too young or too old to experience the wonder of Jesus' birth that long ago night in Bethlehem. We're never too young or too old to worship our Savior with rejoicing. Please give us expectant hearts full of joy and ready to worship. In Jesus' precious name, amen.